welcome to uh, the first of all, we hope will become an annual series of uh, science fiction and science fiction, uh, something about the future. And it's, uh, uh, it brings together notable science fiction authors with noteworthy architects, masters of the best environment. Um, it represents our first step toward a burgeoning relationship between the Office of Park Center for Human Imagination, which is housed at UCSD, and the uh, School of Architecture. We look forward to developing that further. The Office of Park Center of Human Imagination um, explores how imagination operates at neural, cognitive, and social levels, particularly how imagination is enacted through activity and through action. Um, it seems to us that nothing better displays our imagination than getting interesting science fiction writers to think in a narrative form about the future and to have architects to think in a visual way about the future. Both architects and science fiction writers, well, architects always think about some kind of narrative when they're uh, presenting their work. But narrative as a mechanism for exploring the requirements of a structure is something that could be developed more deeply uh, in anthropology and in architecture. And we thought that by bringing uh, science fiction writers whose job as authors is to develop the uh, concepts of narrative in a deep way, uh, that would be valuable for architects. And we thought, of course, that science fiction writers would have a delight in seeing some of their ideas in visual form. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I think it will be a great discussion. I'm going to show you now where the other side is. There, they are uh, at this uh, fancy center, the uh, Qualcomm Institute, a very high technology institute of telecommunication and internet technology. Uh, and perhaps in a year, when uh, the Barclays moves to the Security, then um, you will have a comparable structure, and I believe our telecommunications problems, such as they are, will be minimized. The effect of mental clock in the following way. After uh, I'm about over, uh, Sheldon will tell Brown, uh, director of the US Quest Center, will say a few words there, and then it's with Stan Robinson, who is our science fiction author. He'll speak for about 20 minutes, and then his run. Hot this week, I will introduce the event briefly. There should be a dialogue to work between the two for a while, and then we have questions from both sides. That's the structure. There's a reception in the North Cloister by Hausman following the end of this. Okay. Uh, Stan will now speak, and Sheldon will now introduce. Sheldon? Well, thank you, David, and thank you to audiences on uh, both sides of the pond. Um, this is our, as David says, this is our, our first uh, engagement of this, of this, and uh, thank you all for being um, uh, audience member guinea pigs in this experiment. Um, you'll be, uh, uh, I think you'll find your, your uh, attendance here well, well worth your while. Um, uh, as, as David mentioned, this kind of engagement between how we think about the future and how we enact the future uh, by putting together conversations between designers and uh, people who are paid and think deeply about speculating about the possibilities of the future, we think is a, a great conversation to, to enact. Um, so we're thrilled that uh, for this one, um, on, on, on this side, we have uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, so uh, he's an alum of UC San Diego and one of the surprising many science fiction authors that are alums of UC San, Di uh, UC San Diego. And, and he's very generously involved in a lot of aspects of things that we do here. Um, he's uh, uh, he's on the board of the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, which we hold annually here every summer. He's on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. 
and, um, and has been very involved in helping us uh, start the Clark Center and, and with many of the activities that we do. Um, and he's very involved with other things like Muir College, and I think he's doing a couple of talks later today, one at Muir, one in the Literature Department, and I think one in the Physics Colloquium, and you know, maybe two or three others that I'm not aware of, but you know, he, he'll have a busy day here on campus. Um, he's published um, 18 novels, maybe you know, plus or minus. Um, uh, he's had a half a dozen short story collections, He's won every award in science fiction uh, multiple times. Um, Nebulas, Hugos, Locus. I think he was just awarded a, a Robert Heinlein uh, Award for uh, uh, kind of a, a lifetime achievement level award. And, um, and his work, uh, throughout all these works, uh, he, he has a, a set of themes that emerge in different ways of things about uh, economic and social justice, um, about the role of the scientist as a citizen, um, which maybe is a little opposite of what we often hear about the citizen scientist, but the scientist citizen, I think, is a really important concept in the work. Ecological sustainability and the interrelationships between nature and culture and the way they kind of re-describe re each other and refashion each other continuously. Um, uh, and um, so I think we'd be hard pressed to come up with someone who has thought as deeply and thoroughly as uh, Stan to consider the fate of London in 2080. So Stan, maybe you can kick us off. Well, um, thank you, Sheldon. Hello, David. Hello, London. And hi, San Diego. Um, great to be here and again doing something with uh, the Clark Center, which is uh, uh, always a real pleasure for me. And today I, I do want to talk about a sea level rise um, because it's an aspect of, of uh, climate change that um, is becoming more and more um, uh, something that we're aware of as an issue going forward in the future. And uh, climate change, we've been thinking mostly about the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is um, its carbon dioxide levels. These are things that can be, at least in imagination, uh, like the thermostat on the wall, something that we could change by human efforts, by industrial efforts. We've already changed the, at the atmosphere by the addition of CO2. It's possible to imagine that we could remove that CO2. Um, and so the atmosphere is, is um, at least in human imaginary, something that we can manipulate. Now the oceans are not like that. The atmosphere is very diffuse, and if you were to crush the atmosphere down to the same density as water, it would be about 30 feet thick all over the surface of the Earth. And yet the ocean is, say, you know, an average of uh, something like three, four, five thousand feet thick and it's liquid, and it's not amenable to human manipulation. Um, we've changed its pH because the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere, about 40% of that ends up in the ocean, and we have acidified the ocean, and we can't uh, undo that. But also now, sea level rise. The estimates of sea level rise have been rising themselves amongst the scientists, so that it used to be spoken of in a matter of millimeters, really, per decade. And yet now, um, uh, after some really uh, quite um, contentious uh, battles over what might happen in sea level rise, it's getting to be more and more acknowledged that it's happening faster than we thought it was, the, the rise in sea level. Now, partly this is the warming of the oceans, which is part of climate change. The warming of the oceans just simply makes the water uh, expand itself, but this is a minor part of it. The major part of it has to do with the ice that is now above sea level in uh, West Antarctica, Greenland, and East Antarctica. And some of that ice is already below sea level, but this is part of the story. If all of the ice on Western Antarctica were to come loose and get into the ocean as water, sea level would rise by seven meters. If all of the ice on Greenland were to become water and join the oceans, again, sea level would rise by seven meters. Um, Eastern Antarctica, where the ice is piled really high, essentially about 9,000 feet thick, 
uh, all across a continent that's the size of the USA and Mexico put together, um, if all of that ice were to melt, sea level would rise about 60 meters. So the ultimate rise, and especially for Americans, if all the ice on this planet were to melt, sea level would be 270 feet higher. Now, that isn't going to happen fast. Not at all. That's not the issue. The issue is what could happen fast. And what's uh, recently James Hansen and his collaborators, 15 co-authors, wrote a paper and published it just this year, although the, the preview of it came out last year, which suggested that there was a time in the past, and they're studying this in paleoclimatology, in which the Eemian, where there was only a one degree Celsius rise in global average temperature, but a four to five meter rise in sea level within 100 years. This is remarkable and uh, inexplicable, and so their effort was to try to explain it, and this is quite a complicated argument that they made, almost a work of art, and the scientists, the 16 co-authors of this paper come from many different disciplines, because you, estimating sea level in the past is complicated by the fact that the lithosphere itself is a little flexible and goes up and down on its own. But what they think happened is this, the ice in eastern Antarctica is not as stable as we thought it was that it, um, all of the basins come down to the sea in big valleys, and the ice that is at sea level itself sits there as a dam that holds the ice behind it. Simply the weight of that cake of ice is sitting there, um, and it's below sea level slightly, but it's resting on the ground. And that means that the ice behind it can't simply slide down into the ocean. Now that's different from, say, Greenland, which is actually like a bathtub with cracks in it. And strange but true, the Greenland ice sits in a bowl and only slides down to the ocean through uh, breaks in the bowl that are big glaciers. And they're sliding faster. Greenland is indeed melting really quickly because the ice in Greenland is really a remnant of the ice age that ended 10,000 years ago. And it's way further south than it ought to be, except it's a remnant. It's sitting there, it's like fossil ice. So it's melting fast. But in East Antarctica, the ice that's sitting at sea level is essentially a buttress that's holding the ice behind it and uphill from sliding into the sea. The warming of the ocean that we are experiencing already happens to circulate around the Antarctic uh, continent in a um, uh, clockwise m m uh, manner if you were looking at it from above, and it, it warms at precisely the area where that ice is grounded. And so there's a wonderful phrase in the Hansen paper, the buttress of the buttress. The, in other words, there's just, it's nowhere near as secure as, as they thought, and so their theory as to what happened during the Eemian and what could happen in our near future is that the buttress of the buttress goes water cuts under the ice that is actually the only dam, lifts it, and then everything that is above it and uphill can slide rapidly off into the ocean. So in eastern Antarctica, there's two basins, the Totten Basin and the Wilkes Basin, that if they're all, of the, all of the ice in these particular basins were to slide into the sea, that's about four meters sea rise each. At that point, when you look at all of the potential sources of ice, uh, floating off into the ocean and rapidly melting. The idea that um, in, in the year uh, 2080 we might be having higher sea level is not anywhere near as um, unlikely or surprising as we thought it was even, say, 10 years ago. So um, one of the points that they make in this paper is that um, if sea level rise, if the rate of sea level rise doubles every 10 years, that's a very rapid increase because doubling is powerful. And you quickly get to scenarios in which by the year 2100, um, and so I, I guess 2080 is our, is our scenario building exercise here, so a little bit less than that, but by 2100 there, there's uh, the distinct possibility that sea level will be a meter higher or even more. Perhaps it just depends on how the slide goes because the ice doesn't have to melt up in the air. It has to slide into the sea, at which point it displaces the same amount of ocean as it would after it melts. So um, it's an unstable situation that once we've initiated the movements, we cannot stop them. 
We can't dam the ice sliding down these gigantic basins and these gigantic glaciers. So what does it mean? Well, um, it's commonly said that about a, a fifth of humanity lives in the coastal regions of the world. Um, there are estimates now that in terms of immediate displacement, if sea level were to rise even uh, one meter or two meters, that about 100 million humans would be immediately displaced. And so they would be refugees. And I would want to remind you that uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and New Orleans flooded, about um, 10,000 people were displaced and many of them permanently displaced. So um, when you uh, think about 100 million and you run the magnitudes, what you find is that this would be the uh, sea level rise like that worldwide would be the, an effect of about 10,000 Hurricane Katrinas. And we weren't that great at dealing with even one Hurricane Katrina. So it indicates the, uh, the kind of zone of, of um, uh, humanity's emergency that we would run into. Also, it has to be said that in the globalized economy that we live in right now, uh, trade is important. Trade runs almost exclusively through ships, through shipping ports. So the coastal areas of the world and the shipping ports, the great coastal cities of the world and the great shipping ports, which are not always identical, um, would be hammered by this. And so you can imagine a, a refugee crisis, um, an economic depression by the disruption of trade itself. Manufacturing would then have nowhere to send its stuff. And then also the possibility of, of food problems. So um, uh, the coastal area is, where, is, is, is also where rain falls uh, as compared to the in, inland areas of the continents. And so although it's completely speculative to, to try to um, estimate what might happen to uh, food supplies, if we have even one food crisis on this planet, it's going to be um, a, a, a really a, a game changer for everybody. Um, it, it won't be something that we can respond to very well. So when building um, scenarios, narrative scenarios, from this new, relatively new situation, um, I've immediately thought to myself, well, what can be saved? Because for sure, what you have to say is that people at that point will not um, um, put ashes on their head, weep, and leave the coastal areas. They will not. They will cope. There will be salvage. There will be restoration. There will be a coping of various kinds in its largest sense. And so you have what I call the intertidal. The area between low tide and high tide would be shifted uh, uphill and inland quite a bit. And, and therefore, um, the question becomes how much in the, in the flooded area of the intertidal can be reoccupied. So technologies of salving, saving buildings that are drowned at the coastal area and facilities that have been drowned will become something that we do because an infrastructural investment that is literally um, quadrillions of dollars and um, uh, probably millions of man hours of labor will not simply be abandoned, but people will attempt to save it. Then also, the beaches will be gone. And as a you know native of Southern California, and I spent 10 years in San Diego of my life, the idea that the beach cultures of this world all gone everywhere is a kind of a aesthetic disaster or a cultural disaster of major magnitude. And I'm thinking people won't abide it. The sand will still be there, you know, uh, five, ten feet down, a little bit offshore. And I'm thinking that landscape restoration will also include the reconstruction of the beaches. They'll just put barges out there, dredge that sand up, move inland, bulldoze the areas that are the new low tide, high tide line, drop that sand there, and, and try to restore the ecology. So landscape restoration and ecological engineering will become a major effort at the coastlines itself and at uh, centuries down the line, the beaches that do exist are going to be human works of art. They're going to be landscape art on a macro scale in order to bring that culture back because people aren't going to just let it be drowned. Then, um, the, this is something that I, I thought was a joke that I proposed about 10 years ago when I was examining this uh, scenario in a novel that I called uh, Green Earth, or its new title is Green Earth. Um, say the sea level's rising, that's water. Could we put the water back up on the eastern Antarctic ice cap? It struck me as the kind of thing that somebody would say at an NSF meeting, and then everybody would laugh, and then everybody would think, well, you know, maybe it's best to save quadrillions of dollars in the beaches of the world. Let's see if we can do it. 
And now, just last this year, um, uh, Potsdam Institute has done the has run this exercise quantitatively. Could you put water back up in the middle of Antarctica, let it freeze there? It would be salt water. It would be strange. But it would uh, also, the question is, could you put that much water up there? And they decided that to do that would take about 8% of all of the energy that humanity generates right now in terms of the terawatts necessary to pump water. And then they said that if you had 60 of the kind of gigantic pumps that the Army Corps of Engineers and the Dutch used to polder areas, like New Orleans, like vast parts of Holland, that 60 of these pumps scattered around Antarctica working during the summer months and necessarily using solar power, clean energy. It would have to be, or else you would be increasing your carbon problem at the same time that you drew your water out, and we don't have the fuel for it anyway. So you have to postulate clean energy, but then you have to uh, suggest, well, is the, are the coastlines of the world worth an effort of this sort, and can humanity organize itself that quickly to get the water back up there before the damage has been done? These are open questions, but that's what science fiction is for. Um, I think I can end here and pass it over to uh, Usman for his part of this discussion uh, by saying that um, a disruption this severe but also in slow motion is one of the greatest challenges that civilization, civilization has, and it is an aspect of the climate change problem. It's just more inexorable than changing the content of the atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, and yet, with these ideas of pumping the water back up on the Arctic cap or, or trying to um, turn the inner tidal into a useful human zone, so that what if Miami was a big Venice? What if lower Manhattan was a kind of super Venice and the, um, the, the basements of the building were uh, aerated and protected by a very strong substances that kept them dry, kept the city functioning like a super Venice? Um, possibly that's an adaptation that people would even enjoy, and again, it would be an aesthetic act rather than just a survivalist act. This is, uh, I suppose it's not inappropriate to say that um, I, my next novel will in fact be called New York 2140 for this very reason of the exploration of the Super Venice. And so with that um, little teaser, I will pass it over uh, to see what uh, Usman has to say about this scenario. Thank you, everybody. I'd just like to introduce Usman now, please, uh, who is a trained architect, uh, trained as an architect, and created responsive environments, interactive installations, digital interface devices, and dozens of mass participation initiatives throughout the world. I don't know if we can intervene with David over there, but David, we, we've lost you. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me again? Yep, you got to be very close to that mic. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that's fine. Um, so, Usman is very distinguished and very capable, <laughs> and we're all looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Can I click this one here? Yeah. How's that? Can you hear me over there in San Diego? Yes, that actually sounded very good, so. We're getting your, your slides are now showing up here. 
There okay, we go. Just coming through a little slide. Yeah, can you hear me over there in San Diego? Yeah, we got you. It sounds good. We see your slides. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you, Dan. That was fascinating, and I uh, really appreciate the dialogue we've had in email to, uh, to get to this point. Um, this has been quite a difficult talk for me because uh, I'm way outside of my comfort zone here talking about something that happened basically 64 years from now. I tend to work in the here and now, in a very specific local context of people that I can actually shake hands with and see eye to eye uh, and not speculating um, uh, many years in the future. So one thing I'd like to do is actually just say thank you to um, Ling Tan in the, uh, in the audience and also uh, Jose Luis de Vicente, who's the curator of uh, uh, Big Bang Data at the Somerset uh, House, he might have seen, has helped me kind of um, structure my thoughts here. Um, the reason I found this a little bit difficult, and I just want to kind of kick off with this for a second, is that uh, to a certain extent, what I'm being asked to do is speculate. And there is a design practice known as speculative design. Uh, and it's not something that I do. I would kind of put myself more in the participatory design uh, end of the spectrum. And the difference is up here. Um, and this is, of course, my very personal uh, uh, explanation of the difference. And it's really just a, a way of me trying to make sense of how I do what I do. Um, is that speculative design, and to a certain extent, futurism, attempts to extrapolate from the here and now to develop some kind of a plausible scenario sometime in the future. Um, to a certain extent, it takes account of inevitabilities, and it, in many senses, presents itself as inevitable, in part because one of the functions of speculative design is really to make us think about now and the decisions we make now so as to be challenged by this kind of vision of the future. So you'll very often find that a speculative design practice is, to a certain extent, founded on the notion of dystopia. Um, projects tend to be ironic, maybe even tongue-in-cheek, really trying to prod us into thinking about things. Now, participatory design, which is really the genre, I suppose, I, that, that I operate in, um, has no end product. It doesn't have an extrapolation. Uh, there is no kind of final image of where you get to at the end. Um, when I'm designing, I'm not designing to a specific outcome. I'm trying to think about how can I design a framework or a system or a structure that enables other people to increase the number of possibilities. So rather than thinking about a single inevitable uh, uh, outcome, I'm thinking about how do I actually maximize those outcomes. Um, and what that means, really, is that in a sense, this is a utopian project. Uh, it is an attempt, really, to say, in a very earnest way, that this is how we can do it. Um, and I'm always asking myself, how do we do? How do we build it? How do we get there? How do we actually get to 2080? How are we actually going to make it? I have to make this project very personal. Really, it's the only way that I can think of uh, immersing myself in it. And really kind of questioning and imagining myself 54 years from now. Because I am in this project. It's the only way I can think about it. So the question is, what do I know? I know that the year is 2080, 64 years from now. Um, 64 years is actually not that much. 64 years ago was, what, 1952. Um, if you think about building if you think about the kind of interactions between people and the concept of neighborhood, the concept in the West of privacy, the concept of communication, um, things have sped up and have appeared to shrink, but we have not dramatically changed the way we live uh, uh, collectively. Um, we have changed. I'm not saying that we haven't. But 64 years is not that long a time. Um, the year is 2080, it's 64 years from now. The other thing I know, because this is one of the premises of this scenario, is that the sea level has risen. Um, 
Dan talked about Hansen's uh, uh, paper. Uh, we actually went back an email about whether we should be dealing with the one meter that was originally set to us uh, or another height. Um, it turns out that if you look at London in a one meter sea level rise, it does not dramatically change the shape of, uh, of the city, or I would argue the, the, the specific interactions between people. I've actually looked at more sort of a sort of three to five meter rise, really to think about how the, 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 the condition actually um, changes the way we actually interact with each other and with our building. Um, I'm 108, 109 years old. Uh, I've managed to get here uh, by hook or by crook. Um, uh, and uh, I'm probably one of the very lucky few, because even in this room, not many of us, not all of us are going to make it. Um, so there's something, uh, some, something has happened that has enabled me to get to this point. And I live in London, that's the other uh, thing that I know. Now, what do I assume based on these things? First, I assume that I have somewhere to live, and I've chosen a place. So a couple of years ago, this came onto the market. It's in the middle of the Thames, uh, and I actually almost bought it. I, I put in an offer, and I, and I actually was going through contracts for various reasons. I didn't go through with it, but this is a structure that was for sale for less than the cost of a two-bedroom flat in London. Um, uh, and so because I was so kind of personally connected to it, I've used this as my site. In, Hindsight, now having gone through this whole design process, I think I should have bought this because this is the sort of structure that I'm going to need if I'm around at 109 years old uh, uh, in the context of a uh, high sea level rise. You see it here um, with um, uh, when the tide has gone out. But when the tide goes up, uh, it goes up a, a couple of meters. So we're really talking about this hitting the brick uh, of, uh, of that structure higher. Um, the second thing that I assume is, of course, that the sea level has affected uh, the map of London. And if you look at this um, website called uh, floodmap.net, what's quite interesting is that you can look at how the, um, the rising sea level affects different parts of London. Um, do this, I'm going to put five meters there. Uh, and you can start to look at how much of London gets wiped out. Sorry, but that idea of uh, moving the Bartlett to here east, uh, it's now underwater. Um, but in fact, um, where it's really affected is, a town, is along this kind of corridor going down the middle of the, the, the city for, for obvious reasons. So this is a kind of interesting uh, exercise to look at that. The third thing that I assume is that this is not a dystopia, right? Because, like I said, my talk as a participatory designer is to say, no, really, how do we actually do this? How do we get this far? Um, let me take a step back to 2016 for a second, so that we can kind of set off on a, on a, on a trajectory. We are actually in a dystopia now. Think about it. London is a battleground, right? The obscenely wealthy and everyone else are battling for geography, battling for the right to live in London. This is the contemporary condition. This is the condition right here and right now. Tools of speculation mean that actually the back-to-back -back houses that I just saw with my students on a field trip uh, from Victorian England, the condition where people are getting more and more cramped into living quarters is being replicated in things like micro flats that are coming up in King's Cross, cramming more and more people into, into place. The notion of property is being redefined by services like Airbnb. The notion of the skyline and the tools for speculation, the high rises going up, the skyscrapers, this is the dystopia, frankly. Um, even more uh, incredible, have you heard about the diggers? So the wealthy are digging basements because they need more room in London. Now, it turns out that it's actually more expensive to extract the digger from the basement than it is to just leave it there and cover it up. So littered throughout London, apparently, according to this article, are these uh, um, 
diggers that have dug out the, the basement. So a couple of decades from now, or 60 years from now, London is just going to have these sorts of diggers that have been left behind uh, that will be at the bottom of the, uh, the river. So that is the, that is, you know, one aspect of, of, of what the um, contemporary condition actually is. Where do the wealthy live in 2016? This is some, I'm taking you through my process of thinking here. This is part of the talk to actually look at how an architect uh, goes through a design process. I looked up where do the wealthy live these days. Um, turns out that actually where they live, this is way behind here, uh, is right along that corridor where the sea levels are rising. In fact, if you look at where bankers live, this is really interesting, because bankers basically live right in our area where uh, the, the, the river is going to flood. So what we're seeing basically is that there is a battle being fought in London, which is essentially a kind of a, a triangle of geography, climate change, and inequality. Um, if you want to look at what might actually take place, one only needs to look at Miami. Uh, in Miami, which is lower down, um, they're already finding that the garages are flooding and their Porsches and Ferraris uh, are, are, are being totaled. So this is the kind of dystopia that we're living in today. Again, my challenge is how do we get out of here? How do we get beyond it? As I said, what's what we see is this kind of triangle. It's a triangle of geography, inequality, and climate change. And the interesting thing for me is that actually this is being played out already. And London really is just an example that we're going to see played out around the world again and again and again. And so this is the scenario that I'm starting with. The question is, when the wealthy are the most mobile, who is it that sits? Who stays behind in London? Who goes? Who actually doesn't make it? Who is it that decides who goes and who stays? It's this kind of narrative that is interesting to me. The process of figuring out how we're actually going to do this. Again, you know, as, a, as somebody who's interested in structuring participation, my question is, how do we ensure that we all go along together? And in this scenario, I can't do that because I know that we can't all go along together. And that is because if you go even a quarter of the way towards 2080, which is 16 years from now, 16 years from now, which bear in mind, 16 years ago is the year 2000, really not that long ago. 16 years from now, who's familiar with the uh, some of the pledges of the uh, COP21 um, agreements in December 2015. The EU has suggested a commitment to 40% reduction in emissions by 2030. 40% reduction. That means that we are faced with a radical redefinition of contemporary life. This is without regard to any of the questions of whether the sea levels need to risen. Uh, risen. In the next 16 years, which is the same as just thinking about 16 years ago, we have to radically re-script how we live. This is not an option. This is not a speculation. This is not some kind of uh, dystopian scenario. This is just the reality of the situation. So given that these, the next 16 years really are incompatible with our notion of living, how do we radically redesign in the time that we have available uh, the way we interact with each other and our, the spaces around us? We've seen some interesting 
new forms of self-organization. There's the Madrid 15M movement, uh, protest from about five years ago, coming up on the 15th of May. Um, I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Occupy Sandy, new ways of people working together, structuring participation, actually dealing with, with a disaster in a way that the government was not able to respond to Hurricane Katrina. Occupy Sandy gives us clues as to how we're going to deal with 10,000 Katrina. Um, the Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong, such a surprise this was in many senses to the Westerners that actually in Hong Kong people would so radically reject the structures of authority. All of these things, in a sense, to me, give a clue as to how we are going to be able to re-script the way we live and that way that we make these decisions together. I'm particularly interested in things like um, the non-technological ways that we're developing to communicate. This is known as the human telephone, which came out of uh, the Occupy movement in Wall Street, where microphones and loudspeakers were not allowed. And so the human microphone was this kind of process of people just yelling on the message from the speaker. So my conception of this has something to do with people coming together in some notion of a liquid or cascading democracy, which is essentially an alternative form of democracy that's not representative, it's not exactly direct, but it's a, it's a sort of a, a melding of the two. It's not my uh, intention to get into that too much uh, right now. But these are the kind of data points in 2080. So we made it. It's now 2080. We need to think about shelter, privacy, the atmosphere, energy, food, companionship. This is the task that I've kind of set myself in the context of having had to ra radically re-script the way I live. I'm also imagining here that I'm 109 years old. I'm 44 now, uh, and I don't think I'm going to change my ways that much. And so to a certain extent, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of imagining that I haven't changed very much in terms of personality, and I haven't really invented a whole lot of new stuff. And part of the reason that I have not invented a whole lot of new stuff is that when we radically re-script the way we live, I think we have to rethink what the concept of innovation is. In many senses, innovation and our practice of innovation has led to the kinds of problems that we see today. Today, The idea that actually we can somehow improve the situation just by, for example, um, using some kind of technological system to deal with a system as if it was linear, only to find out that it's a nonlinear system that results in all sorts of uh, catastrophic consequences. That is something that we need to reject. And I think that the concept of innovation is going to be uh, um, fundamentally redefined as well. So, to start off, um, the sea level has risen. I am now um, uh, in, in this house. Um, you actually unfortunately don't get the benefit of the, uh, the animation here because, it's, because of the slow speed. Um, but we can actually pan around and just have a look at everything that's kind of been submerged around us here. Um, so we've had to rethink what property, community, and privacy are. I'm sort of imagining here that actually I don't live alone. I can't live alone. Uh, I've had to share this structure with others. Uh, we're borrowing some of the structural techniques from uh, the Puerta del Sol in Madrid, uh, we're borrowing things like um, the, the messaging uh, of, of, um, of Hong Kong, the way people pass messages to each other on walls. Uh, but we've also had to rethink what privacy is. And so we've got this kind of system of light walls. Um, they're not actual physical structures that bound us off, but they are uh, light structures that partition off the spaces. We have a sort of a visual privacy, even though we don't have oral privacy. Now, this is um, part of my thinking about privacy in general. If you look at different cultures and different ages, privacy is constantly changing. And my interest here is in a more structure. How are we as Westerners going to re-script what we think is private? 
every now and then, what, what's kind of interesting about this situation is that people's arms kind of fall out uh, of, the, of the light and um, uh, suddenly expose themselves in, in kind of odd ways. Um, The second thing uh, that we've had to do is think about um, energy. And uh, I think that what we've done is we've actually gone back to before the combustion engine that got us in all of this kind of trouble. Uh, and we've now kind of harnessed the capacity of the Stirling engine here. Now, a Stirling engine basically generates movement through temperature differentials. And so I'm assuming that there's a temperature differential from the sun coming from the uh, from the sky and the water uh, in the uh, uh, down the ground, which is generating this movement. And I'm imagining that actually this is uh, plugged in. Here's a, here's a little diagram about Stirling engines over here. Um, unfortunately, not in the yes, uh, There's a this explains how, how a Stirling engine works. Um, and uh, We've actually gone back to Manchester in the 19th century, where hydraulic power was used to power machines all over the city. Um, and this Stirling engine is basically pumping around the structure to actuate all sorts of things. For example, here we have a baffle that is pumping air in and through the structure and filtering it through plants that are uh, essentially things like peace lilies that are filtering out all the vol uh, volatile organic compounds, all the sorts of, um, the, the, uh, there's so many people living on this structure, um, trying to get rid of some of the carbon dioxide and things like that. Um, down here, there is a, a, a farmer uh, actually collecting some, some of the algae that were growing for food, uh, and then putting into um, uh, processing tanks over here. Uh, the interesting thing is that because the sea level has risen and um, uh, the temperature has risen as well. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, sharks in the Thames. Um, uh, so there's a uh, there's a, sh a shark suddenly appearing. Um, and um, over here, this is a, a different batch of algae which has been processed in a different way for a different taste. My my my. What I haven't done here, which I'd like to do, is think about who's cooking. How are we deciding who's cooking, who's, uh, who's cleaning up, um, uh, these kinds of things. These are the sorts of things that I think come out of this um, uh, sort of an alternative conception of, of communal living. So thirdly, uh, I think we are, are going to have to re-script the notion of companionship. Um, and so. You know, all those robots that we're building right now, they just weren't sustainable in the sense of having to re-script what innovation is. Uh, and the idea of producing more physical stuff has kind of failed, so much so that Uber's um, uh, autonomous uh, cars, uh, which you might have just read about today, apparently um, driverless cars would mean a lot more sex behind the wheel. Um, so. Actually, what we've done is we've collected all the driverless cars uh, as kind of privacy bedrooms um, uh, for people, um, because the, the the sort of the, the laser-like um, uh, privacy shields are not quite uh, good enough. But the other thing is that we we still kind of want this this notion of companionship, and what we have are basically these kind of virtual pets that are roaming uh, the corridor. Um, and so here you can see a kind of a cat just kind of peeping up um, up the uh, uh, up the, the the staircase there. So we don't have mobile phones really, but we still have somehow this kind of virtual conception of the world. And the cat becomes a kind of an avatar for us to make sense of the environment, the the the, the, the environmental conditions in and around the buildings. Um, uh, you know. It, it, Rather than reading off sensors, we're watching these animals that roam our, our, our spaces, um, changing size, changing color, getting bigger, disappearing, glitching, uh, and uh, so on and so forth.
Um, and the, the final thing I think we've done, we've done is um, we've kind of restricted the notion of the neighborhood. Um, in, I think at this point, the web is probably dead. Uh, you know, by all accounts, everything that I've kind of held dear about the web uh, over the last 20 years or so is, is fading away. You know, as, um, the notion of being able to link between websites is kind of ransacked by Facebook and Instagram uh, creating their own walled gardens. And basically going back to pre-web days of CompuServe and AOL, um, I'm assuming that there is no web uh, anymore. Um, and I think there's plenty of evidence to, to, uh, to back that up. Um, but uh, here we have got a structure um, made of the, the umbrellas from the umbrella revolution. Yeah, again, very slow update there. Um, but what we have done is we've caught all those sharks um, and we've made them into kites that lift the loft. Uh, sorry, I'm about 20 seconds behind everything I show you. Um, we've, got, we've made our, our shark skin into kites that lift the loft these, these kites way into the atmosphere. Um, and these are actually connected to uh, or, or carrying antennas. Um, because I came across uh, this map, which was kind of interesting to me, which is that um, it's, a, it's a map of all the submarine cables. Um, and these are the cables that actually carry the internet. Um, and it turns out that they're all right on the coast. So all of our kind of internet connections have been decimated in the rising sea levels anyway. Um, and so we've had to re-script the notion of what a network is through uh, this old paper that I discovered, uh, which is um, all about ELF uh, and using um, uh, extremely low frequency to, to create a kind of a radio network, uh, which needs extremely long antennas. Um, and yes, that. Uh, I just wanted to kind of finish on that kind of idea that that you know, in a sense, as much of things have changed, uh, we do still always want to connect. And I think that um, we've changed our notion of privacy. We've changed our notion of property. We've changed our notion of what community is, what neighborhood is. Um, we've changed our notion of, of what innovation is, but we haven't really changed that kind of fundamental human desire to connect. And that's what I'm hoping, that's what I'm counting on if I'm going to be 109 years old. Uh, and with that, I think I will finish. Thank you. Um. Uh, yeah. uh, it's Stan back. Hi. Are you here? Okay. Thank you very much for that um, uh, talk, and especially for um, how beautiful it was in terms of the images. Uh, it's a it's a science fiction scenario um, of, of the first uh, um, kind of degree of imagination. Very beautiful. And I wanted to kind of start the conversation with just a couple of comments like a respondent, but this is sort of the, uh, also what I would like to take the conversation in this direction if you would want to, because you've given me this lead. Um, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, 64 years ago, uh, to me it's a long time, the entirety of my life, but there's one, it's not quite the same uh, now as it was 64 years ago in this particular respect, the population of the world was about uh, 2 billion, or maybe a little less in 1952, and now it's 7 billion. So in 64 years, we've had a, a gigantic increase in human population, which is a big part of the problem. And so 64 years from now, this becomes the question, um, what kind of curve are we on? So this is a science fiction exercise where in science fiction we talk about the straight line extrapolation where you just take the past uh, data on a graph it and then you draw a straight line into the future thinking that things will continue to change the way they have been changing. 
The problem is that that hardly ever works, that nature and humanity don't do that very often. So you have curves like also um, the increasing returns, the kind of a hockey stick thing, which indeed human population historically up until right now looks like an increasing curve return. And those are always rather terrifying because if things go on on that curve, you quickly get to infinities and impossibilities. There's also decreasing returns, the kind of asymptotic uh, cl uh, closure on a flatness, and, and that, that you see in nature quite a bit. And lastly, the combination of these, the logistic curve, very common in ecology, where it takes a while for things to get going, so it's flat for a while, then it rises and something comes together, some confluence or uh, synergy makes for a very rapid rise, but then the resources get used and it flattens off at the top. The logistical curve is really very common in nature and human affairs. And in fact, something like Moore's law about computer chips is just one small part that is relatively flat and straight line extrapolation that if you go before it in time and after it in time, you get another logistical curve. So it's interesting, and then of course the nonlinear break, which you brought up, and those are very hard. You have to use chaos mathematics, and usually what the nonlinear break is saying is you can't predict the point where the break is going to happen. So this is why science fiction is not prediction. This is why you can't predict the future. There are many processes that are going on at once that conform to all these different curves, and they are counteracting against each other in various ways, such that you get a, a thick texture and an impossibility of prediction itself. It's too contingent, too complex. So then I want to follow your lead, Usman, to this idea that we're in a dystopia right now because of inequality and the triangle that you showed, so that some people are saying that Anthropocene, which is our name for this new geological area, should actually be called the Capitalocene, that it's the era of capitalism, not the era of humanity's control. And so we have geography in a corner, climate change in another, inequality in another. And really, geography is sort of um, a little bit unmovable, although we can build dams, we can build the Thames River barrier. Uh, climate change, we've started things that we can mitigate, but we can't r completely reverse them. And so that's a curve that we don't know what kind of curve it is, but we can't um, flatten it out entirely. Inequality is the point where I think we can make changes. And so this is to challenge the common saying that I think might have been said first by my advisor, Frederick Jameson, who was my teacher here at UCSD, um, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. And this has become a kind of truism in that realm of culture commentary. But what I want to suggest is, on formal terms, the end of the world would be a bad thing. Um, the end of capitalism, let's just say provi uh, provisionally, would be a good thing. So what's, what that saying is really saying is it's easier to imagine bad things happening than it is to imagine good things happening. Well, this may be true because fears are strong and hopes are subtler and um, more prone to um, doubt. But hopes are persistent, and, and we have as much hope as we have fear, even on the biological level. So what I want to suggest is that in this future London, in this future world of 2080, the thing that we can do the most is to reduce inequality. It looks like finance is in charge of democracy, of, of the human element right now. It looks like finance is in charge of history, which is one definition of late capitalism. But finance is, in its own terms, massively over-leveraged. It is a brittle and fragile system because if everybody were to go down to the bank right now and ask for their deposits out in cash, the banks do not have that much cash. They have over leveraged to the point where they only have 3% of, uh, of their loans in assets in hand. And this kind of systemic, institutional, algorithmic greed to maximize profit leaves them actually hung out over an abyss where people power is actually uh, can be brought to bear against them in the form of um, demanding your deposits back, structural defaulting on mortgages, refusals to pay debt in a coordinated system. In other words, fiscal noncompliance as a strike. 
We can, as a people, recreate 2008, the crash of 2008, which uh, would be bad except if we, in 2008, we had nationalized the banks the way that we had nationalized GM, then suddenly the banks and finance would be a federal credit union, would be something that worked for the people and was essentially a public utility rather than a private predator on the, the public good. So what I'm suggesting is that as part of this scenario and this recovery from the climate change system that we're in, is that we have to actually conceptualize to ourselves a plan to take over finance. Utopia against finance, revolution against finance, a general strike that comes down to fiscal non-compliance uh, by people who then also have to have the plan afterwards that when the governments bail out finance, which they did in 2008 and which they're going to do again, at that point we have to have the plan in place and the government in place to nationalize the banks. So Usman, what do you think of that? <laughs> I, I think you've said it all. I, I could carry on listening to you for hours. <laughs> Well, uh, but then it comes to a design situation, and what I guess I could follow up on is the, the, one of the more beautiful parts of your uh, scenario is the suggestion that we have to have communal living to be able to cope, and, and that this is a design issue that involves architecture as, a, as much as it does our, our thinking. Well, yeah, that, that kind of came out of... Um a recent field trip that I, uh, I was on with uh, my, my students in urban design, some of whom are here today, we visited the back-to-back -back houses in Birmingham, um, which was basically a phenomenon in the 19th century where houses were kind of sliced up the middle to get twice as many dwellings. Um, and uh, there were a couple of interesting things I think that we noticed. One was that, that compared to contemporary flats, they were actually still quite nice, you know, in size. Um, uh, the second thing was uh, something that hadn't really occurred to me was uh, was brought up by one of the one of the um, uh, people there that we tend to think of the 19th century as being this kind of um, a sequence of progress. Uh, in my mind, anyway, I, I would have assumed that generally people lived better at the end of the century than at the beginning. And this person was actually saying, no, uh, the, the, the quality of life at the beginning of the 19th century was better than at the end, because we got more and more crammed into cities. There was more and more uh, congestion and pollution. And actually, we found the same thing again in the 20th century. Um, and so my kind of assumption is that something very similar is going to happen into the 21st century, where actually thinking about some kind of communal living, which we are engaged in anyway, right? Because actually urban life is communal living. It's a way of uh, interacting with each other on a, on a close uh, uh, proximity. Um, but my presumption is that we still retain notions of identity, of self, of privacy, of, uh, uh, of kind of a desire to configure parts of our own environments and have control over our own environments, even though we are delegating some of the configuration to, to, to a, a more kind of collective uh, response. And so my kind of the, the, the challenge, I think, or the thing that really interests me, the challenge that interests me is how do you actually structure this kind of collective um, design process where everyone's contribution is to a certain extent recognized, uh, but where actually, um, uh, you don't end up with some kind of design by committee situation that, we, that, that, that I think we've realized results in the lowest common denominator rather than the best uh, possible outcome. Um, and so, in a sense, when I start thinking about this notion of collective living, it, is, it has some kind of idea of modularity, of like, you know, areas that people are able to, um, to have their control over, but where they have to negotiate with their neighbors, where what they do abuts with uh, someone else. I'm wondering about the aquatic element of this sea level rise scenario in a couple of ways. Um, it seems like the possibilities of aquaculture and the growing of clams and oysters, um, first of all, clams and oysters and sea, sea life 
seashells like that, uh, those kind of creatures would help to clarify the waters because we are going to have a period of, of pollution of the coastline because if the coastline drowns a little, we've got an enormous number of poisons there that are going to spread and need to be clarified before we get back to clean coastline. So yes, aquaculture, at least when it gets to the point of being edible, but at first as a cleansing uh, process. And then uh, another thing that I think is a little bit um, uh, more architectural is I'm wondering if this newly drowned zone can be rescued, the buildings that are already there, but also new buildings that are built kind of like houseboats to handle the tides. Um, and maybe anchored in place, but any anytime humans try to fight the ocean, they usually lose um, because the ocean between its power and its saltiness uh, is very destructive of our built materials, concrete, steel, everything else. So you would have to, I think, flex with the tide in the intertidal zone, and I'm wondering if that might be, and even casting hook and going off to sea and floating townships if these might be uh, design responses to the big flood, it's something that I've been e exploring in this last year or so. And I wonder what you think of that. Uh, also, I, I want to say that uh, bricolage culture, that, that your images are sort of bricolages, and I'm thinking that the whole response to sea level rise will be a kind of a bricolage culture of putting together things from parts and being magpies of what we've got to salvage something new and interesting. Well, I mean, on, on your first uh, point, I, actually, I wasn't sure if I agreed with you that this idea that we would rescue the structures that get sunk. And um, the reason I'm, I'm wondering about that is that, you know, cities are being built and have been built over the last sort of 10, 20 years, uh, especially with the smart city label, um, which have been more or less abandoned. Um, that you know really don't even have people in them. I'm thinking of uh, Mazdar and uh, Songdo, um, where they're actually having to use tax incentives to get people to move there. Um, and I'm just wondering about whether we wouldn't just abandon the structures that are uh, captured underwater, um, because actually the ones that are most mobile, the ones that are hit the earliest, are the wealthy that will go off to Gestad and build their villa there instead. Um, so yeah, the, the, the thought that we would um, protect uh, some of that lower lying stuff, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that basically. I guess my thinking about it is that yes, the wealthy will go to Gestad. In, in my scenario, I, everybody on the coastline just calls it Denver. So Den <laughs> Denver's notoriously wealthy, unconcerned with the problems involved, disconnected from coastline problems and um, the refuge of the wealth, but also compared to the coastlines, a boring place. So, uh, but on the coastlines, then you have people who were the precariat <laughs> who were the immiserated, they, they already lived in very crappy housing. And then you've got these buildings, and I'm thinking particularly lower Manhattan, um, is skyscrapers that are fixed in bedrock and are not going to fall over, even if they're flooded in their first few stories. So in the scenario, uh, yeah. in the scenario I've been building, people would uh, try to make Venices out of some of these cities, depending, of course, uh, of whether they're on bedrock or not, because a brick on sand will melt into the tide very quickly. The uh, skyscrapers of steel that are fixed in bedrock will still be there and may be available for squatting. And then you get the alternative cultures that you're talking about, the more communal, the alternatives to capitalist culture, possible gift economies, possible alternative currencies. Um, local currencies, local uh, barter. The bioregionalism is always uh, a, a theoretical response to capital going somewhere else. It's when you get rust belts and, and places that no longer have capital investment that the local theor theoretical community begins to conceptualize bioregionalism. But I'm thinking that the floods will enforce a kind of bioregionalism where people have, especially if shipping is disrupted and you don't have global trade, at that point you are thrown on the resources of your own region for uh, food and culture. 
And that's where things could get interesting. And I guess I'm thinking about the return of the commons, because most of Europe and America lives under Roman law in which you can't own the title zone. It's like owning the ocean. So suddenly there might be a return of the commons that I think in political terms might be extremely interesting. I think that what's interesting specifically for me about that is that the opportunity that we're presented with to redesign the actual waterfront, basically because uh, it's in a completely new place now, and to redesign that with much more um, considered thought about kind of ecological mutualism and uh, ecological kind of interaction. You know, right now, rivers carve through cities and basically have a concrete barrier between the water, which supposedly is our lifeblood, and the rest of the city. In fact, even uh, in London, you know, you have uh, a, a road along the north bank of um, the Thames. Of course, along the south bank, you do have pedestrian access. But still, if there are any birds in that river, they can never get out. Um, ducks, you know, would have to actually fly up several meters to get out. Now, if we are redesigning our waterfront, um, and we're hopefully thinking more about the kind of interactions, the ecological interactions, then perhaps that is the site of the commons, the site where the architectural, structural, kind of physical fabric meets the, the, the boundary of water, which is constantly changing. And that might be a, a, a kind of a good site to kind of re, uh, really go deeper into um, uh, the notion of the commons and all these things that you're, that you're describing. I'm wondering, I saw David, I'm wondering if we should shift to question and answer mode and if that's possible on two sides of the planet at once. <laughs> Are there, well, actually, I have a question, so maybe I can start with a question. I'm, I'm delighted to hear about um, uh, using the sea in a different way. Um, I'm reminded of Chicago, where they, uh, in the mid-1800s, they raised up all the tall buildings, several meters, um, in order to put in water purification. The, the, the cheapest solution was just to raise the entire city, and they did that with about a thousand automobile jacks around each building. I, I would expect that a DIY, a, a self revolution, and a complete new attitude to, to use it in some more different with all those basements that now are plotted, but that's a, a, a virtue, that's a, a, a great opportunity. So I would be more that the kind of design response to getting a better attitude to the water than saying it's out there, we're over here, and uh, rent is solving the problem. But materials are so fast, so fast, and energy, there are optimists among us who think that in 50 years, we will have energy much more abundant than we So uh, I think there's a different attitude here. Maybe we do would like to just say a couple of words about if there were better design with respect to the sea and more of the friends that are energy. Um, I, I'll jump in on that. Um, I think that. Uh, for sure, you know, up until now, we've tended to see the water as something that we need to keep out. We've seen it as something that, um, you know, especially in contemporary cities, the river has kind of got this notion of being polluted. Um, but there are there are kind of clues that we can look at for the way this is being reexamined. I'm thinking here of Medellin in, in Colombia, which is uh, which has had its back to its river uh, for decades and is now sort of redesigning um, a, a relationship to that, to that as, a, um, as a kind of a life force um, within the city. Um, like I said, I, I, I don't really speculate about future technologies, which is why I, I'm banking on the Sterling engine rather than uh, uh, <laughs> a fusion. Uh, Sam, do you have any comments? Um, the material science advances will be um, astonishing and useful in dealing with the problems we're going to face. And in terms of power generation, I'm very interested in if we could make um, uh, elements, if we had materials that could withstand the corrosive power of the ocean, of salt water, 
that tidal power and wave power are um, uh, have huge potential for creating energy. So this would uh, not quite be the Stirling engine, but it would be very, very basic. It's the way that the medieval industry uh, powered itself. So hydraulic power of the most basic form of water moving back and forth on a regular way. Um, this would clearly, putting that to use would be a great thing. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. so that's oh. why I, I, I was really interested again from the, uh, the recent um, field trip to see the network of hydraulic power that Manchester used to have um, uh, going from building to building and actually using that force to do everything from power machinery to powering lifts. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, there's, there's a lot of legs there, especially when we're working with the water rather than against it. So maybe, maybe just keeping on the power uh, issue for a moment, because um, Stan, one of the things that you brought up in, um, you know, as we uh, will adapt, we'll, we'll adapt, we'll try to adapt, we will adapt in many ways. And, and as you mentioned, we'll also try to engineer new solutions to the condition, or you know, we'll, we'll certainly explore them further. And you brought up this idea of, of the, the re, you know, the, the rehydration of Antarctica as, a, as one possibility. Um, and wouldn't, wouldn't one of the things that we might be tempted to do is, is just nuclear power all of those pumps? We have good, uh, you know, the submarine nuclear power uh, uh, processes are fairly well established. And so do we find ourselves moving out of one crisis condition caused by overconsumption, over-reliance on, on, on a form of energy and into other crisis scenarios about how we might, un, you know, not so, not so thoroughly recognize the implications of choices that we're making as we try to engineer out of one situation and find, put ourselves into another. Um, this gets us into dangerous waters, but I do think that uh, nuclear energy, um, as run by the U.S. Navy, has been remarkably uh, accident-free. When the profit motive is taken out and cost-cutting uh, cost measures are removed and, and safety is the first criterion, then you get uh, the possibility of nuclear as a bridge technology, but the, the, the mining of the necessary fuels and the waste problems, um, and you can think that it might make a bridge technology, but right now the Chinese have made solar power panels so cheap and improvements in solar panels such that um, in, in current capitalist economic terms, nuclear power makes less and less sense, even when you don't count the problem of the wastes, um, which in some scenarios could be burned as fuel right down to very small uh, pockets of unfortunately bomb grade waste. So it's, it's a really complicated question and it may be that you can just finesse it by saying that if we have really good solar power, really good wave power and tide power uh, and wind power, that, that nuclear is just one of the bridge technologies that we get to a true uh, clean energy. Um, I, I'm, I still say that the amount of sunlight falling on the earth every day is so stupendous and right now our solar panels have about a 25 to 30 uh, percent efficiency of how much they capture in turn to electricity. That's always increasing and it's getting cheaper to make these things. I think solar power might be the way forward. Okay, I've got a question from this side of the water. Um, one of the things that you haven't really talked about in your uh, overview of the, the melting, the science of the melting, is to do with salinity. And I thought it would be worth just asking the question, if you pump the salt water from the oceans um, up onto the ice cap, would, the ice, would it just speed up the melting of the ice cap? And the second is, um, actually, if the reverse, and you just leave the salt water in the oceans, I presume that um, the fresh water from the ice caps is going to be lighter and is therefore going to rise to the top. And you're going to have a catastrophic change to the ecosystem. So I'm worried about whether your oysters and your clams are going to survive. Um, so I'm uh, just wondering if that whole salinity thing um, is worth a bit of investigation. 
Uh, yes, I can say that the, the freshwater cap on the surface of the ocean, uh, especially coming off Greenland, will chill the temperatures there and also perhaps stall the Gulf Stream. So this is um, the explanation for the Younger Dryas, was that fresh water coming off of the big ice cap of the Ice Age poured into the North Atlantic, stalled the Gulf Stream, and, and the world climate was uh, changed in three years. Uh, this is the scenario I explore in my novel, Green Earth. So yes, salinity matters. Um, and also, yes, putting seawater on the top of the Antarctic ice cap would be an experiment in uh, um, salinity uh, uh, physics. And the wind would blow it, the salt would rise to the top. It would freeze, but it would freeze unconformably because salt water doesn't freeze in the same way that fresh water does. It would tend to extrude sections of salt. That would get blown back down in the ocean. It probably, because Antarctica is so big, it, would, it, it, it might not be an effect that mattered. And really, all that ice is going to come back in the sea anyway, perhaps faster because of the saltiness. But by faster, you mean you know 500 years rather than 1,000 years. So as a stopgap measure, it might be that people would say, let's do it anyway, and we'll deal with the consequences later on. I mean, it, it's precisely for those reasons that I, I get a little concerned about geoengineering projects that really we are, every prediction that we make about our effects on the climate um, and on the earth, you know, no matter how many orders of nonlinearity we try and build into it, we've all, we're always off by some uh, order of magnitude. So when we're pumping water into salt water into the Antarctica, and also at the same time Dubai is talking about building a mountain um, so as to kind of geoengineer the, the temperature there. When I was there, I was in a meeting where they were talking about draining the Gulf to spray water uh, on, on, onto the UAE to, to, to drop the temperatures. You know, it's almost like we're sort of, uh, if, if we have not modeled the entire world, and if we do not have faith in that model, and let's face it, there is no way to test the model to sufficient degree of confidence that we know how the model is going to perform. Um, it's going to be impossible, I think, for us to come to any agreement, I'm talking about this collectively across the world, uh, where we can ensure that party uh, over on one side of the world uh, is not building mountains while we're pumping uh, into, uh, into the Antarctica. And so that's, that, that's where my, my concern about those, um, those kind of larger scale initiatives uh, uh, comes from. Yeah, I don't want, I just, very quickly I want to say I'm not advocating these things but just describing what has been proposed and I do think geoengineering is, is um, strange and, but it's sort of like what I just said about nuclear power, uh, bridge technologies getting us to a better state. We are likely to get into a very strange era of, of uh, unconstrained experiments that are not modelable, yes. It's interesting we're talking about terraforming terra. Yes. And uh, that, that brings up a whole set of issues. But um, space solar power seems to be a pretty good answer for the energy problem. You can beam it anywhere, 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter what the weather situation is. It's just a matter of building the infrastructure in space at a point where it can be uh, beamed to any point on Earth. And I'm wondering, uh, what, what would that look like? I mean, there are areas on the globe that are drought stricken, that can't produce any kind of agriculture. And here we've got an abundance of water coming off the ice caps where it could be redirected to some place and be made very useful. Well, these are, again, geoengineering schemes. Um, in my novel, Green Earth, I have them pumping seawater into the big basins of Asia that are dry, the Takla Makan and the like. I mean, these would be like the Salton Sea in Southern California, but more so. And um, the Salton Sea is an interesting space. Uh, the Creating salt seas in Central Asia would change the weather there. Um, and again, it would be impossible to model in advance what would happen. But water is usually good for humanity and for life in general, as opposed to a completely desiccated region. So it could be seen as an advantage. It's, it's really, um, because we have certain powers and we have certain disabilities, in other words, there's things we can do to this planet, and there's other things that we absolutely can't do, like um, deacidifying the ocean. 
we're, all these things are going to be on the table as we run into a, a, an era of, of rampant climate change. Um, hi, Stan. Uh, got another question from London. I was thinking about uh, literacy and knowledge, and in terms of these kind of very wet coastal communities, um, they're probably not going to have access to books where most of our knowledge is. And if they do, they're probably going to get wet and uh, get destroyed quite quickly. Um, given that they're currently our best way of sort of storing knowledge and that it's likely any digital artifacts and infrastructure that we have now will probably be gone as well. I was wondering if you'd thought of anything about um, how people kind of uh, document and share and teach and educate and also as well as well in terms of um, the community sort of very tightly knit communities that you're describing like how how would they you know grow together and, and learn together and that kind of thing well i must admit that the most frightening thing said today is uh, usman's suggestion that the internet might go away um, I can see why he said that, uh, but I do think that that would represent a, a crash of civilization uh, that is in itself a science fiction scenario that's often been told, and it would be very hard to deal with at the point of connectedness and, and globalization that we're at right now. Uh, I agree, literacy is a problem. I have some illiterate characters in my Drowned New York novel who, in the uh, situation of squatting, and uh, ad hoc living have never actually been educated as kids as the school becomes non-compulsory. Um, books are pretty robust. They do get wet and moldy and they curl, but they don't crash and disappear on you. So I have a big faith in paper books as one of the greatest texts of all time. Again, it, it's one of these um, uh, thick textures of uh, uh, contrasting features. I've been thinking that the education of the world, that everybody knows everything because everybody has a cell phone. And I don't mean literally everybody, but there are more cell phones on the planet than there are people. And they're all education devices such that um, we're a better educated world population than any ever before in terms of everybody on this planet knows the global situation in its general outline. That's why so many people are so angry. It's kind of a good lead into my question, actually. Um, it just seems like, I'm going to leave the word government out because it's such a bad word in English, but collective decision making is a response in the current state to future perceived reality. And you guys, even just between the two, have a different concept, I think, of collective decision making. But I'm just curious about your role when you look at moving towards the future from our current situation, where you see the role of collective decision-making being and moving forward, how it develops? Well, we had Usman's suggestion of the kind of cascading vote of direct democracy bouncing around. I love that. But also, I want to say immediately that government is not a bad word. Government is how we govern ourselves. It's the technology that allows 7 billion people to live on a planet in, in balance with the biosphere to the extent we've done it. And I will propose uh, uh, to give it over to Usman, the greatest American science fiction story, which is only 18 words long, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish, which is the future imperative that makes it as a science fiction story, from this earth. That's a, 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 a statement of something you shall do by Abraham Lincoln that we have to always keep doing because government of the people, by the people, for the people is not a given. It doesn't even exist right now. It has to be fought for. But government in, in general as a concept is not a bad thing. Yeah, I'll just answer that and just maybe pick up something that, 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 that you're asking, because frankly, I hadn't thought about the structuring of knowledge. Um, but it strikes me that we're presented with a situation right now where, as ordinary citizens, we largely have to trust a politician, a media figure, a, a scientist, um, a religious figure, and to kind of abdicate that decision making, especially with regard to climate science, to someone else. We have to kind of throw in our lot with, uh, with somebody else. Now, if we're going to get through these next 16, 32, or 64 years, um, we need to be involved 
in that process. That means, to a certain extent, questioning all those standards of evidence and developing our own practice uh, for, um, uh, for really gathering the evidence ourselves of what works and what doesn't work and how we make those decisions with each other. And I think the model of decision making and the model of structuring knowledge will come from that very necessary process. I don't exactly know what it is. But that is, that is how I would see that kind of folding out. So I don't necessarily have a clear idea of what the collective decision-making process is going to be, or even a theoretical idea of what would be best. But I think through the, the imperative of just having to survive, it is the only way that we're going to be able to survive these next uh, uh, few decades. Uh, I want to add to that that um, I, I, the policy-making needs to be collective and democratic and something we, uh, to decide these courses like which geoengineering, which power technology. But in terms of gathering the evidence, this is something that uh, climate change is a hyper-object. No single individual can determine it by themselves. It's science itself. It's the scientific method and the entire scientific community of this earth that is the artificial intelligence that we're often talking about. When we say AI in science fiction, it's a, it's a metaphor for science, which is already artificial and intelligent and does things that humans cannot do individually. And that's what makes it so bizarre. That's why we fear artificial intelligence. No one person can intuit or discover or prove climate change, but the entire network of the scientific method has made a case that no individual has to question or reprove to themselves or decide. It's, it's been demonstrated by a network of evidence and findings that took the whole world scientific community to pull together. It's the great achievement of the last 20 years. Otherwise, we'd just be bumbling along going, well, weather certainly is crazy, isn't it? But instead, we know we've got a crisis. So, so we got to trust science, we got to trust government, but we also have to be the ones deciding what to do with these technologies. Well, Stan, that's, that's what I like about your view of, the, of speculation on topics like this, is you, you, you look at them very critically, but you also look at the underlying mechanisms that are, that are really quite hopeful, that, uh, you know, in some ways might be blamed for getting us into the predicament that we've gotten ourselves into, but are also the very, very mechanisms that are going to get us out of the, these predicaments. So, um, so I think we've hit our, uh, we've hit our noon time here on this. And um, David, are you, uh, are you, are you live in London there? Right. The time is, time is constant around the world. So, uh, thank you very much. It was thank you. And I think it's been a great first event, and I look forward to our next one. So, but this is just super. Thank you. I wish thank we could. You. Yeah, thank you. Have fun at your reception. <laughs> wish you were here. Yeah, me too.